When Alice was feeling bored, sitting down by her sister's side, she followed the rabbit and ran down the hole. Topologists are interested in holes. When you run down a hole just like Alice, you find many interesting things. You actually experience a wonderland, a wonderland of different shapes, cuts and holes and you end up in a fascinating journey. In today's video, we would be talking about certain very interesting shapes, sizes, holes and cuts and run through a fascinating history of how these concepts evolved through the history of topology and learn certain very important concepts and fundamentals. My name is Shaunak and you are watching this video on my channel Physics for Students. A warm welcome to this new video down the rabbit hole. Well, first we would, uh, before going into the video topics, let us see what are the topics we are covering today. So we will learn what are holes and why they are important in topology. We will also learn what is a genus, what are the Euler characteristics, what is a polygon and a polyhedron. We will understand certain important discoveries made by Riemann, Poincaré, uh, Betty and we will also run through what are called loops around a torus why the topologists are interested in holes and what is the essence of homology and how we can use homology in the industry. So we would first start uh, the video with something which we encounter in daily life, what are holes? Now in daily life when we talk about holes we mean we can see a hole running down a tunnel or on a wall etc. But for a topologist holes are something very important and exploring and examining the holes, topologists make some interesting observations. Now, what if I tell you that if a given uh, a planet, say for example Jupiter, how many holes are there? And a very cheesy sandwich, how many holes are there? And a certain number of straws and pipes, how many holes are there? Now, uh, you will leave that the first two of them, uh, if you want to argue, but the third, however, can be viewed through the mathematical lens. So, uh, how, how have mathematicians, particularly topologists, who have studied about spatial relationships? So, obviously, the first two would be no, and maybe the straw will have one, two, or three, or any other hole. So, in everyday language, we use hole in a variety of non-equivalent ways. One is a cavity, like a pit dug in, in the ground. Another is an uh, opening or an aperture in the object, like a tunnel through a mountain, or the punches in three ring, bind paper, and so on. Yet another <coughs> is as completely enclosed place, such as an air pocket in Swiss cheese. So what happens is that uh, home, uh, the subject that we are uh, tr trying to understand is called homology, and homology is the study of holes. Homology detects holes of different dimensions and first we need to understand that why do topologists are interested in holes because the first two instances of a planet and a sandwich obviously there are no holes. So a topologist would say that all but the first examples are holes but to understand why mathematicians even care about the holes in the first place we have to go uh, through certain important concepts and unravel a fascinating history. <coughs> okay, this gentleman right on the left hand side of your scre screen, uh, Eric Wolfgang Weistin, is an American mathematician and encyclopedist who created and maintains the encyclopedias like Math World, which you have seen in Internet and Science World. In addition, he is the author of the CRC Coin Size Encyclopedia of Mathematics and he works for the famous Wolfram Research. Now, the important contribution of Eric uh, Weistin is that he defined what are holes. So here you see a hole in a mathematical object is a topological structure which prevents the object from being continuously shrunk to a point. Now obviously uh, the immediate question is that what is meant by continuously shrinking an object to a point? We will come to that. But the basic definition says that uh, if a mathematical object is being prevented from continuously being shrunk to point, that is what is called a hole. So if I see a sphere, you see that can it be shrunk to a point? No. So that is why these holes in technical terms of topology are called genus. So the genus is the number of holes on a particular surface. 
genus of sphere is 1 while that of a torus is uh, 0 for a torus is 1 for a two hole torus it is 2 and for a three hole torus it is 3 so now it is a time to uh, dig a little bit deep into what we call genus so that when we go into the history of understanding how the uh, holes are important and why we are dealing with holes it will become clear so in mathematical sense the genus which is called the plural genera has a few different but closely related meanings. Intuitively, the genus is the number of holes of a sur surface. So, it is used to connote a group of organisms having common characteristics. This is something which is very uh, relevant to biology. And in mathematics, we call it a few different but closely related meanings. Intuitively, the genus is the number of holes on a surface. Now here I would like to tell you that when I was searching and going through research on homology, I found that a lot of topological terms are something which are closely related to biology. Now, for example, genus is something which is related to biology. Homology, as we will see, is also related to biology. So uh, the genus of a surface is an integer which represents that uh, what is the maximum number way in which you can cut. So, it will give you back an integer value which represents the maximum number of cuttings. The genus is a topological invariant of surfaces and it is a complete invariant. We will see how genus has been further explored in this video. So, genus 0 for a sphere 1, 2 and 3 and so on. So, two surfaces with different genuses are not homeomorphic. So, those who have seen my other earlier videos on this series on topology which is related to homeomorphism and diffeomorphism, you know what is homeomorphic and here is a statement that two surfaces with different genuses are not homeomorphic. Okay, so what we come is that we know that homology is a theory which examines the shapes of holes and two shapes can be distinguished from each other by examining their holes. Now, this is really fascinating, this is really mind-boggling that how we can distinguish two shapes by examining their holes. So, let us see a very quick example. Suppose I have got a two-dimensional sphere, which is something that is like this. And this is closely connected to a closed curve, which goes something like this. And I call this to be a topological space, which is called X. Now, if I take uh, uh, this part, then I have got a one-dimensional hole and I have got a two-dimensional hole. So, you can see the red dotted mark which demands the one-dimensional hole and the sphere which tells of a two-dimensional hole. Now, if you take a kind of a closely looped curve, which I have got one, two and three, and if I call this topological space as Y, then you see that it has got three one-dimensional hole, which are these one to three and zero two-dimensional hole. Now, if we take X and Y, we cannot say that X is uh, homeomorphic or these two topological spaces are not equal. So, this shows that if we get two different holes, that means that the two uh, topologies X and Y are not the same. So, this is a very trivial, very simple example, but this shows clearly that how the homology theory is used to examine the shape of holes and here we distinguish the topological space of a sphere connected with a closed circuit, a closed curve, along with three curves that they are topologically not the same. However, when we talk of shapes, there are different shapes, uh, for example, a tetrahedron, a cube, an octahedron, or a dodecahedron, a uh, icosahedron, these are very rigid objects. I mean to say they are very rigid in nature. You really cannot, uh, you know, bend uh, through them or you can stretch. So, the tools of trades are lengths, areas and angles, right? But in topology, shapes are little bit flexible things. So, as if it is made of rubber. So, a topologist is free to stretch and twist a shape. Even cutting and gluing are allowed as long as the shape is precisely re-glued. So, a sphere and a cube are distinct geometric objects, but to topologists, but they are indistinguishable. Now, these shapes, <coughs> when, we are, when we are doing with those shapes, which we need to, you know, uh, stretch it in a flexible nature, nature we have to go back uh, many years back from now, and we will uh, uh, try to discover something which is very central to uh, topology, which is called Euler characteristic. And it was during this time that this famous gentleman, Leonard Euler, 
uh, first started the topological investigations and examination on shapes of Indy during the 18th century. Now, you might be thinking by then mathematicians knew almost all there was to know about polyhedra, but in 1750, Euler discovered something which I personally consider to be one of the greatest theorems. Okay, so what he find out is that Leonard Euler stated, started investigating uh, on the characteristics of polyhedron, and what he found is an Euler characteristic, which is denoted by the click letter chi, and he found that this chi is equals to V minus E plus F, where V is the number of vertices, E is the edges, and F are the faces. And we will soon examine what are V and E and F and how does it but what was the formula in uh, some uh, in just a uh, uh, summarize he found that any convex remember this is not a concave right a two type of polyhedron so any convex polyhedron surface has the euler characteristic v minus e plus f will be equal to 2 now before we examine uh, what euler's formula will tell us we have to go back a little bit uh, to our basics and we understand what is a polygon so, uh, uh, we, we, we now know what is a polyhedron as a solid object whose surface is made of a number of flat faces themselves are, uh, you know, uh, are bordered by straight lines. So, polygon, we can say it is a solid object whose surface is made up of flat faces which themselves are bordered by uh, straight lines and each face is in fact a polygon, a closed shape in the flat two-dimensional plane made up by joining two straight lines. So, Polygons are, uh, uh, these are examples of polygons. Remember, polygons are not allowed to have holes in them. So, the figure below this left hand side, this is a polygon and this is not. Right. So, it, it should not have any uh, plane. Now, a polyhedron is uh, something one step advanced. So, when you move up to one dimension and up, it is a closed solid object whose surface is made of number of polygon faces. So, the number of faces from polygon comes to what is called a polyhedron. Uh, now, this is, uh, for example, a uh, you know, pyramid and these are different shapes of cubes, uh, tetrahedron, etc. So, now that we have understood what is polygon and we have understood that polyhedron is an extension of polygon to three-dimensional figure, we will now explore what is called the Euler characteristics. So, if I take a kind of a, uh, this kind of a cube, so, we can find out these are the face, I mean to say the face which really is, is on the on the other side, the faces and then we have got edge which is the uh, the long one and then we have got what is called a vertex. So, we call the corners of the faces vertices so that the vertex lies on at least three different faces. Okay, so uh, we will look into the convex polyhedra. So, here is a polyhedra where you can see that the vertices are four edges are 8 and the faces are 4 and if we apply the poly uh, Euler characteristics it results into 2. Similarly for the cube part it results into 2 and for this uh, 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 complex part it results into 2. So what uh, essentially it gives up is that uh, you know the, 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 this, this, the convex polyhedra will have the Euler characteristics of 2. Now, what about non-convex polyhedra, which are not con convex, will have a different Euler characteristic. So, for example, this con non-convex polyhedra will have 1 and even this will have 0. So, this is what the Euler characteristic speaks about of the convex polyhedra. Now, try to understand the significance. Now, that this is a very elementary observation in the 21st century where we are standing, but it has deep connection to many areas of mathematics, topology, group theory, and yet it is very simple enough that we can teach to anybody, any, anybody, any school student. But actually it eluded and it surpassed the intellect of centuries of geometers like Euclid, Archimedes, Kepler, and uh, uh, many other people. Because the result does not depend on geometry particularly, it depends upon the shape itself and the shape itself is topological. Now, we, uh, we will see that the first step uh, uh, in understanding the homology theory was first taken by Euler in order to give a formula and this formula is being used extensively all over the industry but you see how elegant and beautiful it is. Now, remember that the only polyhedra which really doesn't work out 
is that those who have got holes in them and something like this. But Euler's formula is true for cube and uh, icosahedron. It turns out rather beautifully that it is true to pretty every polyhedron. The, so only polyhedron that is which has got holes. So Euler's formula is work with simple polyhedrons, not with non-simple polyhedrons like, for example, a cylinder, a kind of a cone, and a kind of a sphere. Right. So this is where it really doesn't work out. Now, when we are talking of Euler characteristics, uh, which actually frames out the different numbers, and these numbers helps us in order to uh, identify a particular shape, we will also have to go back to another Swiss mathematician. Uh, his name uh, is Simon Antoine Jean Loyer. He was born around 1750 in Geneva and is known for his work uh, in mathematical analysis and topology, and in particular the generalization of Euler's formula for planar graphs. Now, Euler's formula, for instance, in 1913, by the Swiss mathematician Simon Euler recognized that if you punch a hole in a polyhedron, just like the left-hand side illustration, to make it a more donut-shaped, then the uh, topology uh, would change into something like this. So, V minus E plus F will be equal to zero. So, interestingly, while uh, Euler and Euler imagine their polyhedra as solid, Euler's formula is computed using only zero-dimensional vertices, one-dimensional edges, and two-dimensional faces. So, Euler's formula V minus E plus F actually derives from the two-dimensional surfaces of the polyhedron. So, each surface has its own Euler number. Ultimately, the bottom line lies in whether the objects are topological or not. Now, this topological understanding of Euler's formula, which we are just talking, that in which the shapes were stretched like rubber-like and they are not rigid, this was first presented by another great mathematician uh, who is not known uh, too much, is Johann Benedict Listing, at around 1861. And although he is much, not much remembered today, Listing is actually the first who replaced the term geometry acetus and used topology in that and is first known to have discovered the property of Mobius strip. So you see that uh, that Euler's formula has been much more used uh, in, in the sense that it is not rigid, it can be stretched and the coining of the term in our due course of history was done by Johann Benedict Listing. Now, in the same time, when we are talking about the discovery of Euler's formula and geometry has been changed to topology, how can we forget about this great gentleman, which we are now coming up in the next part of our video, and I would call this episode as how many times you can really cut an object. Now, it might sound weird at the beginning that why we are talking of cuts, but it will soon become very clear. So, we are talking of this great person, German mathematician, Bernhard Riemann, and he was studying surfaces uh, uh, that arose in his study, what he was doing with complex numbers. Now, what he observed is this. How many times the object could be cut without producing two pieces? So, he observed that the one way of counting holes was by seeing this one, that how many times the object could be cut without producing two pieces. For a surface with boundaries such as this one, uh, a pipe, or you can let us call it as a straw, which is uh, two boundary circles. Each cut must begin and end on a boundary. So, according to Riemann, because a straw can be cut only once from end to end, it has exactly one hole. Right? Right. You see this one that it is this that, that I just noted. Okay, let me go back. So, this is the boundary, right? So, because it can be cut only once, so it has got one hole. If the surface does not have a boundary, just like this one, like a torus, the first cut mu must begin and end at the same point. So, a hollow torus can be cut twice, once around the tube and then along the resulting cylinder. So, by definition, it has got two holes. So, this is an astounding discovery, I would say, a way of visualizing topological objects and uh, imagining that how they can be cut uh, if it can be cut once, it has got one hole. If it can be cut two, it has got two holes. Now, taking ahead and going ahead with Bernhard Riemann's this observation, another great mathematician of all times, Avi Poncare, 
was the next to build on this and he greatly expanded the study of topology and he published the groundbreaking 123 page articles analysis citus in 1895 now uh, it is in five sequels that he actually uh, uh, planted lot of seeds in topology and these seeds actually today blossomed into plants and here bearing the feet fruits so notably among those concept of homo homology which Poincaré uh, introduced is to generalize Riemann's ideas to higher dimensions. That means, for example, a circle or a pipe or a torus or a straw. All of them, uh, um, Poincaré actually wanted to capture everything and include them into higher dimensions. Obviously, because once we move up the higher dimension, things become much more easier and we can generalize things um, in a much much more better fashion. So the one-dimensional circle, like holes in a straw or binder paper, the two-dimensional cavity, like holes inside a, uh, anything like a cheese, and beyond higher dimension. So doing that, the number of these holes actually we found what is called homology. So homology is something where we are dealing with certain classes of numbers, which will give us an idea that how we can classify your separate objects. And also, one important concept came, which is known as Betty numbers, and it has been named after the uh, Italian mathematician Enrico Betty, a friend of Riemann's who had attempted similar work. Now, these two concepts, homology and Betty numbers, are very closely related to each other, and we will go back now to Enrico Betty, uh, who was an Italian mathematician, mostly remembered for his 1871 paper on topology that laid to the later naming after him the Betty numbers. He also worked on the theory of equations, giving early expositions of Galois theory. He also discovered Betty's theorem as a result in his theory of elasticity. Okay, so informally we can call a Betty number is the maximum number of cuts that can be made without dividing a surface into two separate pieces. You see that Betty number and what uh, you know, Riemann told is something similar, but we will just look into that. Don't worry, we'll give a illustration which will become very simple. So, uh, the loops informally an object in our space is simply connected if it consists of one piece and does not have any holes. So, uh, the loops can slip and slide around and can even cross themselves, but they cannot leave the surface. Now, what do I mean by that? It will soon become clear. So, for example, if I've got a kind of a sphere, I put a loop around, right, in the first, then I put it again on the second, and then a third, and then it ultimately shrinks to a point. So, this is something which is called a trivial homology. Trivial homology means it's quite obvious. So, if you are spinning around a loop around a sphere, it will ultimately reduce to a single point. Now, this is also called a very important term in topology, which is called uh, simply connected. So, simply connected means a sphere is simply connected because all these loops can be contracted to a point and other surfaces like straw, torus, loops that wrap around and this is called non-trivial homology. So, in two dimensions, a circle can is not simply connected but a disk and a line are. Spaces that are connected but not simply connected are called non-simply connected or multiply connected. Okay, so we will see certain illustrations. So, you see this is a torus. So, you see that how many, uh, you know, cycles the loop can go. One is this one, one is this one, one is this around the circumference, and one is this one. So, what I'm trying to make it a point is that we can produce infinitely many non-trivial loops. I mean to say those are not, which are not trivial homologies on the, on one, and they can wind, double back, and wrap around multiple times. Okay. Okay. So, here you see. This is a torus which I have taken as an example. Now, let us call a loop that now remember that the loops can grow around, they can slip, but they cannot leave the surface. So, let us call a loop that goes through the central hole and around the tube once as A. This one. So, loop that goes around through the central hole around the tube once. Uh, th uh, that now serves as the basis for uh, other loops which you are seeing in this illustration. Since a loop can go around the tube once, twice or any number of times and direction matters, we can represent these loops as A, this is the negative one, the loops that goes around to the central in the opposite direction, and we found another that loops goes around twice, it is called 2A, 
and this loop goes around the circumference as B. Now, see what happens is that we are creating other loops around this torus based on the same loop. But remember that not every loop R is a multiple of A. However, such as the loop going around the central hole along the tubes along the circumference, which we now call it at B. So at this point, though there are no more unique trips, okay, we will turn the page now. Let us see uh, the next part. So because there are no more unique trips, any loop on the torus now can be deformed to follow loops A and B and get some integer number of times. That there are two one two dimensional loops from each uh, from which all others can be built. That means that the Betty number of the torus of one dimension is two. Okay, let me repeat once more. Any loop on the torus can be deformed to follow loops A and B uh, with some integer number of times. That there are two one dimensional loops from each all others can be built means that the Betty number of the torus in dimension 1 is 2. And you see, this is the same exactly what Riemann predicted using his cut, uh, cut theory, or you can say his, uh, his way of cutting. So, what we find here, what we find here is that when the way we are cutting that loop, or when we are winding the loop around the torus, so if we get something which is being built upon the two other loops and it has got one unique uh, trip, that means it cannot be repeated. So it actually gives the Betty number of the torus, which you can internally call the way it can be cut, and that is 2. So you see here, the, so this one is 2, and the way the Betty number uh, of torus is also 2. So the Betty numbers look something like this. <coughs> so for torus, it's 2, for sphere, it's 0, Mobius strip is 1. So uh, by extending obviously to the nth dimension, we get the nth Betty number is the rank of the nth homology group of a topological space. <coughs> Sorry. So if you get this kind of a torus, you see uh, B0, this is a unique way of uh, mentioning, is the number of con connected components. <coughs> B1 would be the number of one uh, dimension of circular holes. B2 is the number of two-dimensional voids or cavities. So, for example, a torus has one connected surface. So, B0 will be one uh, com component, two. Uh, then uh, B1 would be two on equatorial and one along the meridian. So, you can call it meridional, although the English is wrong. And a single cavity which goes through is B2. So, what we can tell from here. So, we understood what is a Betty number something which is similar for Riemann cut. So from here what we can say that with Betty numbers we get a nice tool to do calculations and thereby a unique way to distinguish topological spaces calculating and finding the holes. So if I see uh, uh, a, a, a loop C uh, which is equivalent to loop A. So if I get a loop A which is around here and loop B around here we can use and see C equals to A plus B. So this nice expression is not just for notational convenience. It is possible to make arithmetic, the addition, subtraction of loops and various other ways. So we can say that if loop C is equivalent to loop A combined with loop B, we can write C equals to A plus B. This is a very nice algebraic way of representing and that is the essence of homology. We will soon see the definition of homology and how it relates to. So, what we can say is that we can form many such loops and the one-dimensional uh, homology group might consist of 7a plus 5b and 2a minus 3b and so on. So, the one-dimensional homology group can consist of this. So, we found a nice algebraic way relating the Betty number and creating holes uh, creating loops around the torus. Now, uh, uh, the Betty number uh, is used by topologists to count the number of holes. So, we can say that a straw and a t-shirt and a pant, how they are different, they are different by counting the number of holes. So, these objects are all topologically different because their homology groups are different. In particular, they have different number of holes. So, you see that in our everyday life, we use this. Now, if we call C equals to A plus B, 
when we are actually combining algebra and topology. And in mathematics, by the definition of homology, is a general way of associating a sequence of algebraic objects such as abelian group or modules with other mathematical objects such as topological spaces. Now, it was during this time, independently, this great lady, Amy Neuter, a pioneer who developed uh, his uh, study on the study of groups and other algebraic uh, structures, and Neuter's study to helps us to understand and structures and theorems of algebra to understand topology. So, this is uh, uh, this is the an important contribution of Amy Neuter, who further developed into group theory, and today we know about that. Okay, so finally we come boiling down everything to the final definition, the central idea that what is homology. Now, if you do a quick research in Google or you go to Wikipedia, you will find the first term of homology is not mathematics or topology; it is biology. So, in bi, okay, so we we will come to that part. But before that, what we will see is that uh, it all started first with Euler. So he founded what is called the Euler characteristics, which is something with the convex polyhedrons. Then we found what is called the Riemann, that is a Riemann cut, showing the number of cut equals to the number of holes. Then it was Amy Neuter who developed group structures independently, and Johann Listing coining the term topology, followed by the framing of the Betty numbers, which was further generalized by Ari. Avi Poincaré into homology of n dimensions. So this is how the evolution of thought of homology happened, starting from Euler and ending up to Poincaré. Okay, so what I was talking about is that if you look into uh, internet and search out homology, you will find first the term biology, where homology is relevant, not mathematics. So in biology, homology is a similarity due to shared ancestry between a pair of structures or genes in different taxa. Uh, a common example of homologous structures is the four limbs of vertebrates, where the wings of bats and birds, the arms of primates, the front flippers of whales, and the four legs of four leg vertebrates like dogs and crocodiles are all derived from the same ancestral tetrapod structure. You see human, then a dog, then a bird and a well. So evolutionary biology explains homologous structures adapted to different purposes. However, in, in terms of mathematics also, we talk of homology where we try to define uh, uh, into some common ways, which is uh, how two shapes can be distinguished by examining their holes. So just in biology, a homology is similarity due to shared ancestry between two pair of structures. In mathematics, homology is a kind of a I would say similarity between two structures and by distinguishing their holes. So you see that uh, a circle is not a disk, uh, has a hole through it. The disk is a solid. The ordinary sphere is not a circle because the sphere encloses two dimensional hole, while the circle encloses a one dimensional hole. However, because a hole is not there, it is not immediately obvious to define how to distinguish different kinds of holes. Now, in this figure, you see that uh, this uh, particular shape, uh, this 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 one B, this can be you know further and further shrunk into a pole, into a point. So homology was originally a rigorous uh, mathematical method for defining and categorizing holes in manifold. <coughs> so all cycles on the sphere can be continuously transformed uh, uh, each other and belong to the same homology class. And this is how. Uh, it is said to be uh, homologous to zero. Now we can take further examples, but I'm not doing in this video because the uh, video is uh, getting pretty long. So all cycles in the sphere can be continuously transformed into each other and belong to the same homology class. So that is why it is called homology. So you see that that the basic essence of homology between biology and mathematics is not different. It is a similarity of structures. This is also similarity of structures. Here we try to find the structure based on the ancestors of the bone structure or something. Here also we try to examine the structure based on the loops that go around and then make it a class which we will later learn as homology of classes and how we can do. But all things taken true, there is one still question which uh, keeps disturbing our mind is that can we use homology into practice? 
Although mathematics have had a basic understanding of formology for almost a century, algebraic topology continues to be an active research uh, area further binding together algebra and topology. So researchers also have been branching out into other directions, developing the theory and algorithms necessary to compute homology of shapes represented digitally uh, and building tools to identify the underlying shapes of large data sets. I would like to bring attention to uh, uh, famous or with the two uh, very important figures of our times. Windy Silva, a mathematician specializing in applications of geometry and topology. Dr. De Silva had a good fortune to work with many fine researchers around the world publishing research in machine learning, topological data analysis, sensor networks, tensor decomposition, and persistent topology. On your right, Robert W. Grist, an American mathematician known for his work on topology methods in applied mathematics. Together in 2007, they produced a wonderful paper uh, which shows uh, how to use homology to detect holes in the census coverage based on certain just very naive and crude information. We have other we have other areas of uh, research of homology, but uh, it would take again too long to uh, uh, point on that. But this is what uh, Windy Silva and Robert Grist immense contribution in terms of using homology to do certain sensor networks. So that's all for today's video. I think that I have given you a idea on the history and how the evolution of homology uh, has done through certain very easy and illustrative examples. So to, just to summarize, we understood why holes are important, why topologists consider holes to be important, how the evolution of homology started with Euler, Betty, uh, Emmy Noether, and how Avi Poincare, uh, you know, generalized it, what are torus and loops, and the application of homology with De Silva and Robert Christ, which we just saw. So thank you very much for watching this video on topology. I will be back expanding more on homology and going further with important discussions, discoveries, interesting ideas, fascinating history on topology. So stay tuned, subscribe to my channel Physics for Students, click on the bell icon and click on all to get all the notification from Physics for Students. This is Seanak signing off for today, promising you to be back with some very interesting, fascinating stories and topology. Till then, goodbye. Thank you for watching this video. We appreciate your time and patience. If you want to connect with us and provide further feedback, comment or suggestions, please email us at contact.physicsforstudents at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. See you soon in the next video.